Hello, I'm Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we're going to be going through unit number 13, lesson number 1 on variability and sampling. Now, this final unit in our textbook is on statistics, and the statistics that we'll be doing will be very, very different than what you've done in the past, in all likelihood, depending, of course, on where you've studied statistics in the past. So, Let's jump in to the first lesson, because I really want to lay the basis for this entire unit right up front. All right. Now, statistics is all about trying to explain variability that occurs in a data set. And variability is the simple fact that outcomes to experiments, wait a second, that sounds familiar. Oh yeah, it's like probability language, that outcomes to exper experiments are different. You know what I mean? They're just, they're different. You know, I grow a bunch of plants and one plant grows this much and another plant grows that much, right? They don't grow the same amount. And the purpose of statistics is trying to explain the variability. Why does it occur? What has made the variability in the data? Why is it there? So today we're going to do a lot of discussion. We're, we're going to do, it's not going to even feel like math except for maybe the last exercise. We're going to do a lot of discussion about the different types of variability and the different types uh, and the different ways that we collect data. All right, so let's take a look at the types of variability. Okay, there's quite a few different types and in exercise one, we're gonna kind of really walk through them. All right, it says the following types of variability can change uniformly, uniformity of a data set. In other words, if everything was like the same, then we'd run an experiment and every single data point in our experiment would be identical. But that's not the case. There's variability, right? This one is this much, this one is that much. They're different. So let's talk about that variability. All right, now these are presented in no particular order. But the first type of variability that we're going to look at is what's called observational or measurement variability. And this is variability that is introduced into data either due to the measuring instruments themselves not being precise enough, right, not being exact, or differences in how two people read the measurement. Now, you might say, this isn't variability, these are mistakes, but no, sorry, this is variability, right? So think about that. Can you give an example of measurement variability? All right. Well, I'm not going to write all of this down. I'm just going to have like text come up on the screen. But here's a good example of measurement variability. Let's say you have two students who are working together in like a physics lab or something like that. And they measure the amount of time it takes for the ball to fall a given distance, right? And you can just see it. You know, maybe one person's holding the ball and the other person's got the timer and they say, drop it. So they drop it and they, they hit their timer and then it hits the ground and they press the timer again. But then if the other partner does exactly the same thing, they're going to get two different readings. And they're going to get two different readings because they have different reaction times, right? Um, you know, when they say go, when they say stop, all of that. Last year, my son did this science fair experiment as a fourth grader with another friend of his, and they rolled a ball down a ramp. And for each trial, we had both my son and his friend do that measurement because we knew they were going to come out different and we wanted to make sure that we could explain that variability. All right, so observational or measurement variability. Variability that's introduced just because, hey, humans are humans and they, they read things a little bit differently, they react a little bit differently, and instruments are instruments. You know, this scale may weigh a little bit different than this scale. All right, let's take a look at letter B. Natural variability or inter-individual <laughs> variability. That's a, that's a mouthful. I like natural variability better. And this is variability that accounts for the fact that members of a population, members of populations are just, they're different, right? Members of a group that we're surveying or working with, they're different, right? And they're different because they've got different genetic codes, different, you know, different ways they behave, act. Human beings and other living creatures are amazingly complex, and those little differences are what are called natural variability or inter-individual variability. So how might this come up in an experiment? You know, think about it yourself, and then I'll give you an example. 
All right. Well, let's say you've got two people. They go to the gym and they work out exactly the same amount of time, right? And let's say we're taking a look at how much weight they lose. Well, they're likely to lose different amounts of weight for a variety of reasons. You know, maybe one of them has a higher metabolism rate than the other one. Maybe one of them worked out a little bit harder than the other one, right? But that's due to inter-individual variability or natural variability. You could also not go with people. You could go with plants. You know, let's say we were, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, how fast plants grow and, you know, given a certain amount of water and sunlight, you know, you got these two seeds, you plant them give them exactly the same amount of water, the exact same amount of sunlight, they're going to grow a different amount. All right? And the amount that they grow is not due to the amount of water or the amount of sun because they got exactly the same amount. The differences in how much they grew was due to natural variability or inter-individual variability. Tricky. All right. Well, pause the video now and write down anything that you need to. Okay, let's keep going. Other types of variability. Ah, letter C, induced variability. Now this is my favorite type. Okay, and this is really, this really contrasts with the, the last one that we looked at, okay? Induced variability is when you got the, the scientist, right? And, and the scientist breaks like members of a group into two treatments or more than two treatments, right? And those two treatments are treated differently and variability arises because the two treatments were treated, the two groups were treated differently. Induced variability, variability that we're forcing on the data. All right, so think about this. I'm sure you can think about almost any scientific experiment and come up with an example of this. All right, two examples here. Two groups are tested on memory. One group is allowed to sleep for eight hours, and one group is only allowed to sleep for four hours. There's variability introduced here in their ability to remember, right? It's introduced, it's induced into these groups. Now, don't get me wrong. You could still have somebody who slept for four hours be able to remember more than somebody who slept for eight hours, and that's more because of natural variability, okay? Another example, two groups are given a drug to help reduce cholesterol and a placebo. A placebo is a drug that does nothing. It's a sugar pill. Again, there's variability that's introduced here because of the different types of groups. One getting the drug for cholesterol, one getting the placebo. All right. So some of that variability is induced. It's forced upon the groups. All right. Let's talk about sample variability. This one's exceptionally important to us. This is the type of variability that occurs because when we take multiple samples from a population randomly, um, well, we're going to get different samples. Okay, so if I've got this huge population and I'm going to just take a sample from it to see what that sample looks like, there's going to be variability introduced based on what sample I take. Okay, so think about an example of this. All right. Multiple samples of people are surveyed to determine their preference for a particular political candidate. The differences in the proportion of people who like the candidate between the groups is due to sample variability. In other words, you know, as I sit here, there's a presidential election only about a year and a half away, right? And you could have a group who goes out there and randomly samples 500 people and finds that candidate A is liked by 52% of the people. Then they go out and they randomly sample another 500 people, and they find that that candidate is only liked by 49% of the people. That's sample variability. In other words, even though, you know, we'd like that 52% or 49% to represent the population as a whole, we're going to get some randomness and some variability introduced simply because of the random sampling process from the population. The real key in statistics is being able to look at a data set or look at multiple data sets and explain the variability that we see as one of these types. Oh, sorry about that. I got so excited I bumped my computer. <laughs> All right, pause the video now and write down anything that you need to. All right, let's keep going. 
Randomization. All right, this is a very important topic. Randomization is the idea of randomly assigning or picking subjects of experiments. Randomization is primarily used in statistics to avoid what we call bias. All right. Now again, let me let, let's talk about this a little bit before we jump into exercise two. You know, when you're somebody who's truly a statistician, right? then you're almost always trying to understand variability based on all those categories we just looked at. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to think that the variability due to one factor is actually due to another. And the way that you try to eliminate that is by using randomization as much as possible, making sure that the subjects that you're studying are as randomly chosen or assigned as you possibly can. All right? And and people who do statistics have all sorts of fancy ways of doing this with great names like a blind experiment or a double blind experiment, you know, ways of really trying to remove bias from the selection process. So, what we're going to do now in exercise 2 is we're going to look at three major ways that data is collected. All right? What we want to do is give an example of each and explain how randomization is part of these methods of collecting data. Okay, So let's take a look. Surveys. I think everybody's heard of these. These are collections of data from a population where variability is not induced by treatments, but by the sample itself. So you get variability in a survey due to just sampling variability, due to the fact that you grab this sample or that sample. So think of a situation that, that would require a survey, and how you might use randomization to avoid bias being introduced. All right, let's take a look. All right, let's say we have a marketing company. They want to see which major soda is preferred in the general population, right? Because they want to sell to everybody. So they take a random sample of the population. Now again, you know, maybe they have soda A, soda B, right? Let's say we just got two sodas, right? So you either like soda A, you like soda B, maybe you like them both, maybe you like neither of them, right? Now you're going to get some variability introduced there just due to the sampling, right? It could be that you take a sample and just by bad luck or by good luck or however you want to think about it, you, um, you pick a sample where a lot of people like soda A, but in the general population that's not the case, all right? But randomization here is very important. Um, if you don't randomly pick people for this, then you could introduce bias in ways that are unexpected. Now, an expected way that I give here, let's say that you're trying to do this survey and you stand outside of a natural grocery store, in the, in the Northeast, maybe a Whole Foods store. So you're standing there and you're, you're asking people, do you like soda A better or do you like soda B better? Well, the problem is now there's bias that's been introduced because the people you're talking to aren't random, right? They're not randomly picked from the population. They're picked from people walking out of a natural grocery store where you would expect more people than in the population in general to like less sugary sodas, less natural, uh, like more natural sodas, things like that. All right? So in a survey, you want to randomly pick people so that you're your sample represents the population that you care about as well as possible. All right, let's keep going. Same, same exercise. Now let's talk about observational studies. So the last one, that, 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 that was a survey. An observational study seems pretty similar. It's collections of data from a population where the assignment of individuals from the population into treatment groups is not under the control of those performing the study. All right. So in other words, we're going we're to collect data, and we're going to divide that data into different groups All right. so that we can, we can kind of look at, um, at treatment or induced variability. But the people that are actually collecting the data don't have any choice about you know, who gets to go in what group. They just naturally go into that group. So can you think of situations or a situation of an observational study. All right, let's take a look at one. Let's say we got a health or organization and they want to explore whether a person's state of residency has a relationship to their income level. All right, 
A person, therefore, is assigned to a treatment group not by their organization, but simply by where they live. Here, those conducting the study must be wary that they make their sample of people from each state random. If they do not, they may sample an unusually high or low income level sample from a particular state, which could bias their conclusions. So again, you know, we're let's say we, we've narrowed it down to just 10 states that we're looking at. Maybe it's the states in the Northeast or something where I live. All right. So we're trying to see if there's a connection between income level and whether you live in Maine or New Hampshire or Vermont or New York or Massachusetts or Connecticut, etc. Right. Well, we have to be a little bit wary when we pick people. Now, we have no choice. Somebody that we pick that lives from New York has to go in the New York category. But we want to make sure that we don't do something silly like all the people we pick from New York, we decide we're going to pick from folks who live in Ithaca, New York. All right. We don't want to do that. Ithaca, New York has two major colleges and universities in it. So if we pick people there, we're going to be picking people that have higher than normal education levels, which may, which may also lead to higher income levels. So we want to try to make that random process, or we want to make the process as random as possible so that the people that are assigned to the New York group and the Vermont group and the Massachusetts group look like the overall residents of that state. All right, let's take a look at one more. An experimental study. All right, now th this is one of my favorites because again, this is the classic situation. You know, a scientist is gonna run an experiment with treatment groups. So you got group A, group B, group C. But now you, you've, you, you're, the, the subjects aren't, you know, being assigned to the treatment group, you know, by default, i.e., hey, you live in New York, so you gotta go to this group. You live in Massachusetts, you gotta go to that one. But this is situations where we are randomly placing people in these treatment groups, all right? And this really controls sort of the, uh, the possibility of inter, like, or sort of like natural variability, right? It kind of introduces the same amount of natural variability in all of the data. So think about a study that might be an experimental study. All right. Let's say we've got seeds divided into two groups, one of which receives an organic fertilizer and one receives a synthetic fertilizer. Okay, so you got these two treatment groups. This is an experimental study. And then the study looks at, <clears throat> excuse me, looks at which group has the greatest growth rate. Randomization here is extremely important, right? We don't want the scientists to be looking at these seeds going, yeah, I'll put this one over here. Yeah, I'll put this one over here. Yeah, maybe I'll put this one over here. And I'll put this one over here. Now, we don't want the scientists to do that because you never know. The scientists might decide to take all the seeds that look pretty good and put them into the organic fertilizer pile and the ones that don't look so good and put them into the synthetic fertilizer. What we really want the scientists to do is sit there and take a seed and flip it, flip a coin. If the coin lands on heads, they're going to put it into this pile. And if it lands on tails, they're going to put it in this pile. Then the next seed's going to come up. They're going to flip a coin. If it's heads, it goes in that pile. If it's tail, it goes in that pile. And that way, each seed is randomly assigned to one of the two treatment groups, and we get rid of any bias that could be introduced from a scientist just kind of making arbitrary decisions about why to put a seed in one group rather than the other. All right. So there's lots of different ways to collect data. And there's lots of different ways that variability gets assigned to the data. Let's take a look at actually just one more exercise. Not that many exercises today. A list of 10 people's heights in inches is shown below. So you got these 10 people, and yeah, I'm giving them a number. Person 1 through 10. And then there are their heights, arranged in no particular order. Letter A says randomly select 5 heights from this list, by using the random number table that goes with this lesson. Choose a random spot in the table and move down the column. Select the first digit of each number. If you get a repeat, eliminate and keep going. If you get zero, use this as 10. Now you probably like random number table. All right, well, there is a random number table attached to this lesson, but I'm just gonna show you a little clip of it. This is an example of a random number table. And random number, number tables are exactly that. Now, the way we might use it in this situation is we might say, okay, 
I'm going to go in here and I'm going to pick this number. And maybe I'll even pick this column. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down this column, three, four, six, five, four, six, five. How many am I supposed to choose? Five heights, eight, five. Oh, I already have five, five, I already have five, four, I already have four, four, I already have four, eight, I already got that one, zero. Oh, that's okay. I'll use that. So I just use this table to say, well, all right, I need height 75, height 69, height 65, height 62, and height 63. All right. And what I can now do in letter B is I can calculate a sample mean for that. Now I never know exactly what sample mean I'm going to get, so let me add those up. We all know how to do a mean, right? We add all the values together. All right, when I add them all up, I get 334. And when I divide by 5, I get 66.8. All right, that is my sample height. But of course, if you were doing this with lots of students, somebody else may have grabbed, uh, I don't know, let's say we grabbed this column, right? That would be height 9, height 3, height 4, height 7, oh, I got another 4, and height 1. Height 9 is 66, height 3 is 60, height 4 is 75, height 7 is 58, and height 1 is 70. Those are different heights than before, and if I calculated their mean, Hard to do this up front, sorry, but then I'll get 329 divided by 5 gives me 65.8. Now that's relatively close to the 66.8, but it's not the same. And what type of variable is being introduced there? What, what is the variability that's getting introduced? Why are those two means different? All right, and that gets us into sampling variability. In other words, some variability gets introduced just because at the random sample that we pick is different from another random sample we might pick. All right? All right, pause the video, and then we'll finish up. Okay, clear it out. Get rid of my random number table. And let's finish up. All right, so today was a lot of talking on my part, and I apologize for that. Make sure to go back, though, and really understand the four major types of variability, how they're introduced, examples of each, and also understand the three major types of ways that we take data, and how randomization kind of plays into all of those as well as bias. This is critical because as we move into statistics proper and we start to get our formulas and our means and our medians and all of that, it's important for you to have the sense of what statistics is really used for. And it's used to explain variability and why variability occurs in data. All right. Well, I want to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler. And until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.